everybody, it's Taylor from Dames a la Mode, and today I am starting on a new project, which is a 1790s open robe. And here are a few museum examples to show you what I'm talking about. So an open robe is a pretty simple project, which is really good news for me because right now it is Monday morning at, uh, I don't know, like maybe 1030. I have no idea what time it is. And I have to wear this open robe on Sunday. So I have about a week to do it, which is a pretty tight deadline, but this is a really simple garment. I have a few things about this project that are going in my favor. Number one is that this gets worn over another dress and I already have that other dress done, which is going to be my white satin 1790s sleeveless gown. So I'll be wearing this over that gown so I don't have to make the full outfit, I'm just making the open robe. So that's one good thing in my favor. The second thing in my favor is that I already have a pretty decent pattern for this, which is the 1790s jacket that I wore over <laughs> that white satin evening gown. This pattern was made for me by the Modern Mantua Maker, and it's obviously gonna need a few changes because it's gonna have skirts, and I'm gonna change the way the front looks just a little bit, but I am working with a basic pattern that's already done. So, um, oh, let's show you the fabric. So my fabric is this beautiful taffeta, like a blue and gold taffeta that I got in LA in the garment district at Costume College several years ago now. It has that beautiful taffeta swish. The stripes do make it a little bit more challenging, but also a lot more fun because it can do a lot of really cool patterning and design with the stripes. That will mean I don't have to do a lot of trimming. <laughs> So stripes are a nice secret way to get a lot of oomph out of a fabric without having to do a lot of extra work. But I'm really excited to use this beautiful fabric. The first step in this process is breaking this fabric down into usable chunks. First, I need to measure the length on the train on the underdress so I can see how long I need to cut my skirt fabric. I have plenty of fabric here. This is a four yard cut. So I'm going to measure generously so I can have a long train on this dress. Next, I'm going to cut off the skirt lengths because I'll be focusing on the bodice first, and this way I know exactly how much bodice fabric I have to work with. I like to fold the skirt length and actually put it back safely onto my fabric shelf where I won't accidentally cut into it, which I've definitely done before. I'm cutting the bodice out of a scrap piece of a strong white cotton. The fashion fabric is pretty wobbly, so a sturdy cotton is a good lining material. Since these bodice pieces are so tiny, I can use up scrap fabric, but I just need to be really careful that I'm paying attention to the grain lines of the lining, since it's easy to lose the grain on a piece that's wonky like this one. I always like to mark the grain with a big obvious chalk line, so I have a good reference point. Okay, all the bodice pieces are now cut out, bodice lining pieces and I'm just gonna sew up each one of these seams and I'm gonna do it on the sewing machine. Oh, before I start cutting out the fashion fabric, I'm gonna cut out what is going to be a waistband for this dress. I want to highlight the stripe motif, so I'm going to cut this first so I can get a long, uninterrupted piece of fabric for that. It's a nice, easy cut thanks to the stripe pattern and I'll just set this piece aside for later. Cutting the center back is the most exciting bit of this whole garment because I get to create the chevrons with the stripes. Playing with the angle will give you a different effect with the stripes. Keep in mind that I am cutting this piece off the grain, but since it's going to be mounted to the strong lining fabric which was cut on the grain, it's okay here. The lining is what will take the strain of this garment. Before I sew it up, I'm going to pin and test to make sure it looks how I want. Oh, perfect. The chevrons are so satisfying. Now I'm just going to sew this up the center back with my machine.
Next, I'm going to mount this piece to the back lining. I'm just pinning it on and then carefully sewing it down to the lining along the seam using a widely spaced back stitch. This will attach to the lining with an invisible stitch. It is day two of my project. Uh, yesterday I got the bodice all cut out and the skirts as well. And I just started doing work on the construction of the bodice. So today I'm hoping to finish the bodice construction. Ooh, that might be kind of a pipe dream because I have a lot of jewelry to make today. So we'll see what I can manage. I'm gonna work on the jewelry first and then I'll come back and do the sewing. Um, but I would like to be able to get the bodice done today. And then I can start attaching the skirts. Uh, one thing I haven't at done at all yet is the sleeves because they're the things that are going to need the most work and I, I just don't want to fiddle with patterning sleeves right now. So um, I'm going to put that off to the last minute, which is probably a terrible mistake, but you know, that's just kind of how I roll. <laughs> I've sewn up the sides to the front pieces by machine and now I'm going to mount them to the back. They get pinned onto the lining at the side seam and then I'm carefully turning under the seam allowance along the side back seam and pinning it down, being careful to match the satin stripe. Because of the angle of this curving seam, I can't match all of the stripes, so I'm focusing on that dominant satin stripe and trying to match that one as accurately as I can. Okay, so I'm gonna sew the back part of this down by hand and visible, and I'm gonna do this for two reasons. The first one is that during this cool transitional period, sort of between the 18th century and the Regency, you get some interesting vestiges of old 18th century styling, including seeing some visible pleats that are top stitched down from the outside. So I just like that design element. And secondly, and most importantly, it's because this gives me the fine detail to be able to make sure that I'm matching up that stripe as perfectly as I can, which is really difficult to do when you're blind sewing and you have the pattern pieces backwards. So this way I just have more control over it. And since these are such tiny, short little seams, this really doesn't take hardly any time at all. I can do each one of these in less than five minutes, so it's worth a little bit of extra time to make sure I'm getting something really precise and I don't have to worry about unpicking it later. All right, this is my first bodice fitting. So I just have the shoulders pinned closed for now. You can see how the back is gonna look. Pretty chevrons. So my original bodice for this is actually a crossover. Uh, I have it pinned closed now, but you know, one side would cross over the other. So you have this overlap, but I don't wanna do that with this because I really wanna preserve the chevroning stripes. But I'm not entirely sure what I want this whole part to look like here. So I do think I'm gonna open up the neckline some, so it's just a wider, maybe more scoop. And I just have the darts pinned in, so these will be sewn in. But I think I wanna put my waistband on and actually semi-attach some of the skirts so I can get a better idea of what the uh, front is gonna look like in full before I decide what I'm gonna do with this. So these shoulders are in a good spot right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and sew those up. I may just go ahead and take off, you know, an inch right here because I know that it's not gonna be this high up. And then I'm gonna switch over to working on the skirts and then I'll come back to the bodice. But for now, bodice looks really good. The fit's nice. The chevrons are all pretty. Oh, I love those stripes. They look so cool. Uh, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Okay, it's time to grab that skirt piece off of its safe shelf and cut it in half. I'm doing this by pinning one side together to keep it straight and then just cutting right down the fold. This may not be a perfect cut, but I'll even it up in one of the very last steps of construction. I'm going to sew these two pieces of fabric together to create my skirt panels. And I'm going to try my hardest to keep the stripe motif even, which means I need to sew it down perfectly along the center line of my dominant stripe. This just means some slow and attentive sewing and a lot of careful manipulation through my machine. I promise this isn't my usual sewing posture. 
Once it's sewn, this whole seam gets ironed so I can see how accurate I was in my sewing. Okay, it's pretty good. It isn't perfect, but you'd have to be looking really closely to tell. Okay, friends, it is day three and I have about a five hour block of time to sew right now, which is excellent. So I think I can make a good amount of progress. My primary goal today is to get the skirts done so that I can mount them onto the waistband and then think about how I'm gonna place the skirts uh, along with the bodice. So that's what I'm gonna work on today. It's just gonna be a lot of pleating <laughs> and a lot of hand stitching. Uh, so let's get to work. So step one in working on the skirt is actually dealing with the waistband. I cut a long piece of this beautiful stripe here, which I'm gonna use as the waistband, but I do need to mount it onto something because it's, it's pretty flimsy. So what I'm gonna do is cut a strip of organdy fabric and use that as the backing for this and then I'll mount this onto the organdy just to give it a little bit more body and support so it'll help to hold up the skirts when I pleat them onto it. Now that the waistband is sewn, I can attach it to the skirts. This just involves a lot of pleating. I'm just eyeballing my pleats here, which is very, very easy thanks to the stripe. I'm absolutely not a precision pleater, so I just kind of go with it and let the fabric do what it wants. Voiceover Taylor here. Let's just replay that for some extra foreshadowing. This does not go well. I'm absolutely not a precision pleater, so I just kind of go with it and let the fabric do what it wants. Once I have one half pinned, I do a quick visual check of how it's going to look on me to make sure I like the scale of the pleats. This is a good opportunity for me to make them wider or narrower if I need to before I've actually done any sewing. Next, I'll pin down the second half. I'm going to leave the front few inches unpleated and unpinned so I can do some adjustments later. Okay, let's sew down all those pleats now. I'm sewing these down with a small angled whip stitch right to the waistband. I'm also doubling my thread here to give them some extra strength. And don't forget to reward yourself with all that sewing by flouncing around a little bit. With the skirts attached to the waistband, now I can attach the waistband to the bodice. I'm going to center the back seam of my skirt with the back seam of the bodice and then start pinning. I'm just going to sew this down to the bodice using a spaced back stitch along the top edge of the waistband. All right, I actually need to use my dress form for this one. So I'm gonna take off my lovely Italian Renaissance gown that I basically just have here for set dressing because it's so autumnal and use it for my actual outfit. One of my favorite bits of dressmaking is taking the pins out of the skirt because you can really start to see what it's going to look like when it's all complete. I just love the way all these stripes look falling from the bodice. The reason I need to do this is because this white dress has a pretty significant train on it. So I definitely need to make my open robe train to cover it up. But I'm not sure if I want to make it sort of a a square shape or if I want to round it similar to the way the skirt on the train is. So I'm going to kind of play with both of those styles and see which one I think is going to look better. I really thought that I was going to prefer the more squared off version, but I actually really like the rounded version. That's just, oh my God, it's so elegant. Oh, I love it so much. I'm gonna leave the train pretty long. I just really like the drama of it, but also again, the actual skirt 
on the dress is, is quite long too, so I don't want it to be shorter than that, so. All right, here we have the first preview of what it's gonna look like. Happy Thursday morning. Uh, it's day four. Uh, I did not finish the skirts yesterday. I stopped where I had them pinned up, but I'm not actually gonna hem them today because hemming is work I can do sitting at home in front of my TV. So I'm gonna stop with the skirts for today. And hopefully today I will finish up the bodice and then tomorrow I can work on the sleeves and then we're getting real close to my deadline. So um, I have a few hours today to work on the bodice of this dress. So that's what I'm gonna do first. Although it requires me like putting my stays on and my shift and all that stuff, which I hate all the fitting steps. So, but it cannot be avoided. So that's what I'm gonna do this morning and hopefully we'll have some progress very soon. To finish off the bodice, I need to do two things. Determine where the darts are going to go and finish off the front edges. For the bodice darts, I'm basting them closed first so I can try them on without pins and then I'll sew them down with small, strong back stitches. For the front, I'm just gonna pin it closed so that it fits and double check that I'm happy with the way the stripes meet in the middle. Then the edges get turned under and sewn down and I'm finishing the front edges with four large hooks and eyes. These came from Burnley and Trowbridge with three on the bodice and one on the waistband. I'm also turning under the entire neckline at this point and sewing it down to finish the top part of the bodice. Uh, I'm a pretty long way into this project and I just realized that I made kind of a big mistake. These pleats are facing the wrong direction. So they should be pleated so that they face towards the center back, but instead I have them facing out. It's not catastrophic, but I don't, I don't know why I did them this way. I typically, I have, I have no explanation for it. I just had some sort of like brain meltdown when I did them. Um, it, this is not like you never see them this way, but it's certainly not the common directionality of pleats from this period. They usually were facing the back. Um, so, you know, it is what it is. I'm sure as hell not gonna pick these apart and redo them. Even if I had all the time in the world, I would never do that because I think it's not that obvious. Um, but just a little funny thing I wanted to point out that sometimes even when you've been doing this for 15 years, you still <laughs> make just crazy mistakes that don't you don't have any explanation for. So, oh, you pleats, you problematic pleats. Also, this last bodice step includes pinning and sewing down the waistband over the darts and finishing it at the center front. Happy Friday! <laughs> um, we're coming down to the wire. I'm in a pretty good place. Um, I need to do a little tiny bit more on the front to attach the belt to the bodice where I left it undone and add one clasp in the middle. And then the rest of the day is going to be dedicated to the sleeves, which I really hope I can finish. I do technically have some time on Saturday that I could work on it, but I have like responsibilities and stuff. So I do actually have other things I need to do that are not related to sewing or my business. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to finish this up today. It is still unhemmed. That is going to be a big part of it as well, but I can, I can do that as a last minute thing if I need to. So, okay, we'll finish off the bodice now and then we'll get to work on the sleeves. All right, I just noticed something super annoying, which is that I have not evenly matched where the skirts hit at all. I mean, they are wildly different. So this one, which is what I was aiming for, basically ends right where the bust start is. And this one is like two, three inches too wide. Oh, so I must have just really messed up one of the pleats over here or something. So that means that I need to unpick a lot of this pleating and sewing and redo it so that it fits, so that this line is right here. <sighs> Why? Why? 
So I do have a sleeve piece for this pattern, but if you remember, it's a super cool sleeve with diamond cutouts, which was achieved using a two-piece pattern. I need to do a new mock-up to make sure combining them into one piece works okay, and I also need to add just a touch of width to make them a little bit more comfortable. This actually worked perfectly, so I'm going to move right along to cutting out the fascia fabric and putting them together. I'm going to try a new to me method of sleeve construction that I learned about in the American Duchess Guide to 18th Century Costuming, a book I cannot recommend enough if you're interested in historical costuming. The details of how this works are all in the book, but it's a quick and efficient way of putting a sleeve together. Thank you for this great book. Not sponsored. I just love it. Sleeves are all done. Okay, let's put you guys on my dress. I'm sewing my sleeves in first with basting stitches so I can make sure that I have them set properly without getting stabbed by a million pins. And yes, as always, I am wearing one of the sleeves to make sure I don't set the wrong one. This is a really nice trick. Okay, the try on looks good, so now I'm gonna sew these down for real using small back stitches for a strong seam. Okay, sleeves are on and done, so now I need to work on the hem. I already played with the hem a bit, but I'm going to add in a lot more pins to give myself a better guide on the hemline. And then I'm just gonna cut off the excess fabric. I'm doing this along just one half of the skirt. Once all of the excess is trimmed off, I'm going to lay the whole dress out, pin the front edges of the skirt together, and then trim along the second half to match the first half. This way I know it's even and matches on both sides. I'm making the hem by turning under the entire length by 1 fourth of an inch and then sewing it down with a big running stitch. Then I turn everything under again by another 1 fourth of an inch and then sewing that down with a small whip stitch. This seems like an extra step, but it helps to keep the curve smooth when you're going around a big turn like this. It just gives a little bit more precision and control. The undergarments for this outfit are a sleeveless shift, which I got from Willoughby and Rose, a pair of very short 1790s stays that came from the Bohemian Belle, and a petticoat with a train that helps keep the hem of the dress clean. And of course, I'm wearing it all over my white satin undergown. I also added lace to the neckline and sleeves, but this isn't actually part of the dress. These are removable and can be switched from dress to dress. They're just basted onto the dress for easy removal, and they help a lot with making the dress feel finished. I'm really pleased with how well this dress turned out. I love these weird transitional styles you see in the 1790s, so it's always fun to explore this era. It's also a pretty easy style to make and doesn't require a huge amount of fabric or time, so it's a great project if you're new to historical costuming. Thanks so much for joining me on this project, and I hope you have a lovely day.